I had this vague idea that I wanted to write about the 20s in Chicago, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do uh, something about the, the, the jazz clubs, uh, about the gang world, and I was just doing a little bit of basic research, uh, trying to figure out if there was a story to be told there. And as I began to look at Al Capone, I began to feel the same way I did about Gehrig and Robinson, that their stories were misunderstood. Um, and, and Capone had been made into this, this monster, this psychopath, and people forget that he was really a product of prohibition. And when I read these interviews with Capone, I began to see that he was aware of his, of his role. He was aware of the way people perceived him, and he, and he, and he was trying to, to do something about it, that he was upset about the fact that he was perceived as this, this you know, uber villain. And uh, I thought, found that was fascinating, that, that he was begging for sympathy, that he was, he was giving all these interviews to the media, trying to, be, uh, to make them understand. That just fascinated me, because that's not the, um, the way a psychopath usually uh, carries himself. And then, just in the early part of my research, I, I came across uh, some amazing new materials that nobody had seen for, for 70 years, the papers that belonged to the prosecutor who led the case against Capone. So suddenly, before I'd even written a, a word of this book, before I'd even committed to doing it, I had thousands of pages of documents, government documents, some of them labeled top secret, that nobody had seen. No, no other Capone biographers had, had, had this stuff available to them. So, that's when I knew I was going to focus on Capone, and in particular, I was going to focus on the government's case, because I think that's a good way of showing mm -hmm. how he became this, um, this sort of scapegoat, really, for the, for the failure of prohibition. We are under the impression that the principal way they took him down was through text, Colonel Revenue Code. Right. Uh, that somehow they got access to the papers, and is, is that fact or fiction? Well, it's true that the... Um, income tax evasion was the key to their case against Capone, and that's what he, he did his time for. He got an 11-year sentence for a conviction of, uh, of uh, tax evasion. But what, what, this story, what the, that simple story doesn't tell you is that the government had an incredibly weak case against Capone, even for tax evasion, mm -hmm. and that they really thought he was going to slip through their fingers. And there was incredible um, stress and strain all the way up to the, the White House. Herbert Hoover was watching this case very closely. He was really calling the shots. And there was this feeling that Capone was going to, was going to embarrass them by, by getting away, even on the income tax charge. They, you know, they were incredibly frustrated that they couldn't pin him, uh, they couldn't pin him down for, for violent crime. They couldn't pin him down for, for bootlegging. Um, and they settled for tax evasion just as a way to get him off the streets, to at least uh, break up the organization and send a message to the, the American people that, that they were going to take this, these gangs apart, gangsters down by any means necessary. And then he might still slip away because the tax case against him was incredibly shaky. So, so that was fascinating to me. And these documents show that the, the government really tried to make a deal. Uh, they were willing to, to, to plea bargain with Capone. And then at the last minute, um, something mysterious happened and, and the, the judge threw out the plea bargain and forced them to go to trial. What do you think that mysterious thing was? I think there are one of two things. One is the judge just became irate because Capone was going around to his buddies bragging that he was going to get this light sentence. The other thing is that I think Herbert Hoover might have had something to do with it. Um, there's, there's one newspaper reporter who wrote years later that now that all the principal players were dead, he could tell the truth. And the truth was that Herbert Hoover sent his personal secretary to Chicago on the eve of the, uh, the plea bargain as Capone was prepared to enter his guilty plea and told the judge, the president wants to see this thing go to trial. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Did the, would the plea bargain have been much different than the uh, verdict of the sentence? Yeah, the plea bargain was for two and a half years. Okay. And the sentence was for 11, 11. years. Of course, he dies in prison. No, he uh, does not die in prison. Yeah. He's diagnosed with syphilis in prison. Right. He serves eight years of his 11 year sentence and then is released for good behavior. So he gets three years off of his sentence. He's a model prisoner. But by the time he leaves, the syphilis is destroying his brain. Right. And he's um, almost killed by some of the experimental treatments that he undergoes at Alcatraz. But he's released in um, 1939 and lives for another eight years, um, down in Florida mostly, at his home on Palm Island. He still comes back to Chicago occasionally to visit his mother. But for eight years, he stays out of the newspapers. He stays out of trouble. He makes um, no attempt to get back into the gangster life, and partly it's because his, his brain is, 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 
is melting away from the, this neurological uh, illness, um, but um, also in part because you know he, his time had passed. Prohibition was over. His, his organization had moved on to other things. It's really only after he dies that his, his legend is resurrected because of this television show. And the Capone family fought very hard to try to get that show off the air. Uh, they even sued um, and lost. But um, that's really, it's that TV show that really resurrects him, that, turn, that begins to turn him into uh, a legend again. Now, he be, you know, in the 30s, when he first went to jail, there were these movies that were based loosely on his life, you know, like uh, Little Caesar and, and, and the original Scarface. And that made Capone... Um, you know, bigger than life. And then the second generation of people became familiar with him as a result of the, um, the, the, um, the Robert Stack TV show. You have the prosecutor's papers and as you're rifling through them, how did you get them, by the way? The family gave them back in the 80s to a college professor, hoping the college professor would write about the role of this prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And they just sat there for 25 years. And I came across them because uh, I, I found mention in an old Tribune article from the 80s that this college professor was, attempt, was, was planning to write a book about the prosecutor. And I contacted the college professor and said, whatever happened to those documents? And they were still in his office. And uh, he was generous enough to share them with me. I love those stories. Yeah. That's just good digging. That's what it's all about. That's my favorite part of the work. I mean, I like the writing, but the, the research, when, you're, when, you, when you get a hold of something new, especially you know, you know, an 80-year-old story, a 70-year-old story, um, it's remarkable to think that there could still be you know, troves of new information out there. Is there family? Yeah, there's still quite a few family members. Some of his grandchildren are still alive, um, nieces and nephews, and I was able to find um, a few of them willing to talk, including uh, two sisters-in-law who actually knew, who were married to you know, Capone's brothers and, and knew the Capones really well, so that, that was helpful. What was their impression? They think he's been uh, uh, inappropriately mythologized? Yeah, they think he's been demonized and, and that he was really just a, a guy trying to take care of his family and that you know, he saw an opportunity presented by a, you know, a, a really flawed law and that um, everybody was drinking at the time and it's hypocritical to, to blame the guy who's delivering the booze. Yeah. Uh, that's how they see it. What's your impression? My impression was he was not as bad as, as people have made him out to be. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you were around today, uh, he'd, he'd probably be you know, a decent guy to sit down and, and have a beer with and, and he'd, he'd tell a good story, tell you some jokes. You know, you certainly wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him and, and you, you probably don't want to get into business with him at all because uh, it could be very dangerous. But I think that he was, um, I think he was a very interesting character and, and not all bad. Again, impression was that he didn't mind the publicity. No, that was probably his biggest mistake. You know, it's ironic that this guy who committed so many crimes, um, arguably his biggest mistake was, was his ego, was, was his vanity, that he, he welcomed the press, he, he, he welcomed the, the attention, he gave all these interviews, and that really made him into this public figure when all these other bootleggers in New York and Cleveland and Cincinnati, you probably never heard of them today. They were just as big as Capone. They killed just as many people but you've never heard of them today because they were smart enough to keep their names out of the newspaper. What was the biggest surprise of, of Capone that said, I didn't know that? Well, first of all, all the things that I, that I thought I knew about Capone turned out to be wrong. You know, um, not responsible for the Valentine's Day massacre, I think. Um, he, yes, he went away for income tax evasion, but the case was incredibly weak. It wasn't Elliot Ness who put him away. Um, it was, you know, it was incredible, really. But I think the, the biggest surprise probably was just that um, he wasn't a psychopath. He was a product of his times and that, you know, really had he, had, if not for prohibition, I believe he would have been a, you know, a two-bit thug all his life. You never would have heard of him. Was he in fact a baseball fan? He was a big sports fan all around. He loved uh, the prize fights. And in fact, when he first came to Chicago, he, he got into the managing business, managing a fighter. And, you know, if that fighter had been a little bit more successful, maybe he would have uh, stayed in that line of work and <laughs> history would have turned out differently. But, um, yeah, he loved all sports and he loved to bet. Uh, he loved the track. I think um, some of the, some of the um, members of the Capone family think that the, uh, the Damon, and Runyon, Damon Runyon characters in Guys and Dolls are based on the Capone boys because they, they all love to gamble. They love the, uh, the nightlife um, and they were, they were a pretty gregarious bunch. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. This is great. Thank you.